Okay. Good morning, everyone, and um, um, welcome to uh, the presentation I'm going to make on the benefits of development programs within Nigeria. Actually, it's a project that it's at its very beginning. Um, I am more or less at the conceptual framework um, phase of the project, but I think it's something that contributions and suggestions and um, how to develop the work a bit further. So um, I'm going to show you a, a bit of um, what I've been able to discover by looking to two um, leadership programs in Nigeria. And most of the information I have is from interviews of the participants, uh, self-reports, and also of the organizers and coordinators of, of the programs. So um, the long-term plan, as you would see, would be to have a, a systematic overview of the, of the styles of teaching leadership, and then to see how effective they have been. So I'm going to do, uh, uh, right now, what I'm going to do is to talk to you about the NGOs that I know that are involved in these leadership programs, the beneficiaries, so you can get a glimpse of the impact. So even though there's not yet a very clear court, systematic, um, scientific impact evaluation, yes, which is what I hope to do, um, you can see indicators of the impact that these leadership programs are having from the reports that people give and from the changes in lifestyle and also from the um, effect on the beneficiaries. So I'm going to talk a bit about the NGOs themselves, the programs, the core principles, and um, uh, and then a few pointers to, to, to impact that we have already that make it um, make them ideal programs for, for study. And then a few of the challenges they have. Um, so we have an idea of the, the challenges that the NGOs and the coordinators have when trying to um, implement these programs and the, the um, obstacles they face in measuring the impact. And then uh, another overview, more or less, of what the future uh, project could be. So next slide, please. OK, so the first thing I was going to talk about is are the NGOs. So I'm going to just use these two as samples. The first NGO, it's called um, Women's Board of Educational Corporation Society. It's, it's an NGO in Lagos that um, has been operating for over 40 years. But recently, well, compared to the 40 years is recent, about 12 years ago, they started a leadership program. Um, the, the NGO's main focus is, or their mission, is to contribute to women development in order to empower women through education and um, try to encourage a, a passion for excellence. So they did this through personal mentoring, but they have personalized programs for the, the, the people they interact with. And then the other NGO I, I, I'd like to talk about is called Nigerian Association for Women's Advancement. That's a, um, a, an NGO that is looking towards starting a leadership program. This is why I actually got involved in, pro, in, the, pro, in the project really, because this new one wants to start a leadership program, but they want to do it based on the experiences of these other two leadership programs that the other NGO has had. So uh, first is to understand what the NGO is, is benefiting from it. I mean, if their, their mission and their vision goes towards empowering uh, women, helping them to be um, self-supporting, uh, helping them to be um, leaders for themselves and for their community, to be agents of change, then if they do achieve that, that goal, you can see that they have gained. So I'm explaining this because in the, in the subtitle, you saw a win-win for NGOs. So these two NGOs, coincidentally or interestingly, are non-for-profit. So you wonder what can they gain from this, precisely if with a certain mission, and the program helps them to admit, uh, achieve their mission, then you see um, they have actually uh, gained because the, the program helps them to achieve what they set out to do, which is to empower the women and um, to have female leaders who can be professionals, who are proficient everywhere, but all around, which is why it requires a personalized program, which I, I think is a bit more tasking, but maybe more rewarding in the long run for them. So, and the participants, what do they gain? 
uh, well, from the interviews I had with uh, the coordinators or the originators of the ideas too, um, the, the participants benefit at least in, in three ways. First is that um, they learn to direct themselves. They're more self-aware. So there's a personal development that they report after going through the program or along the process. Uh, we'll see how that works also when I discuss the structure of the program a bit. And then um, also the, the participants um, also gain by developing the society in which they live because then they feel they've contributed something to society and they have, they're actually doing things and they can see that things are improving around them. And also the third thing that the participant will gain is that it adds to their um, curriculum details. I mean, it's something that they feel that um, shows that they have done something worthwhile with their time apart from academic pursuits. The other beneficiaries who don't feature in the title is due to the structure of the projects, which is one thing also that makes it very interesting. So the, the program, as you'll see in the structure, has to do with the participants after being trained, going out into the, the, the communities to try and make a difference. So they have projects afterwards. So I'll talk a bit more about that later. But in, in, in some, you can see that the NGOs really, their benefit is that these women are empowered to make change and then they already can see the change with the lives of the people whose livelihoods are affected or the reports of progress at work or learning self-discovery that the, the participants have, have reported. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the basic um, principles of the leadership program is self-leadership. So uh, the, the, I spoke with the previous directors interviewed and then the, um, the current ones. And the, an interesting thing to look at is that the principle that they're trying to apply when training the participants is principles of self-leadership. So I was doing a bit of uh, work also on self-leadership and then uh, one of the things, I mean, that I will be looking at is the facets of self-leadership as so, um, some theories have described them and how they play out in this particular program, self-motivation, communication, relationship skills, um, um, self-organization, management, discipline. So all these facets, I mean, it will be good to look at all the curriculum and, um, see how those facets of self-leadership play out, since this is what the interviews um, revealed. The profile of participants is, is such that their um, high, uh, the, the university students in general, so the, the idea is to um, empower the university students who already have a, a, a relatively good um, academic performance, but need um, other ambits of, of their uh, personality developed and they're willing to uh, join the program. So it's it's a voluntary thing. But then the, the, they ask for letters of um, recommendation from faculty um, just to see if the other, even if they don't have leadership roles yet, uh, look out for those who are interested in taking up leadership roles in things as simple as um, having responsibility in group work to be the group leaders so that while they're in the program you can see them already implementing what whatever they, they learn so the structure is such that you have uh, a theoretical phase and the interactive phase um in the theory they talk about what the leader is what self-leadership is and different um contents or what it means to be a leader and then you have lots of interactive sessions where they have cases they, they, um, they then um, talk about how to implement them in their own particular situations. And then they have a personalized mentoring system to see that the, the, the um, participants are implementing those things as they go along. Then, uh, apart from the weekly seminars, many of them, um, these two programs are almost a year long, even though it's not from constant service, um, contact. Sometimes it's a Saturday program, sometimes it's once a week, sometimes it's two weeks, and they respect also the, the student study program so that they, they have enough time to, to, to um, 
still do well, excel academically while studying or practicing the leadership qualities. So they have uh, seminars, other activities, um, and then they, the other activities in the, in the projects that, that are um, indicators of act actively, actively practicing what is being done is that they, they include service, community service programs. So it turns out that already you can see the excitement from your participant going out into the community and doing things like outreach hygiene talks, career talks for um, secondary school students. Um, sometimes uh, they do uh, renovation projects for schools uh, or many development programs. So you do find them doing um, those um, leadership activities already. Um, making a difference. So, the, the so the, the projects. Then, after all the seminars and teaching and, and practice, the participants then have to go out and have a particular project, or either as an individual or as groups, something they can have that can have a big impact in, in in the society already. So, what they do would be a group will take up, adopt a secondary school, a public secondary school that needs renovation. They do all the fundraising, apply the communication skills and whatever they have learned, and they do something. But these are choices that they have to make themselves, which is why you would say, really, maybe there has been some impact in the life of the participant. And then by the fact of carrying out a project and executing it, she really is going to make a difference already in the community. So all these are the indices of, of, of um, impact that one can say uh, it would be good to have uh, like a systematic study of and see how how well it has done. So as the programs, um, the leadership development program and the youth empowerment for active societal transformation programs, they've run for 10 years and 12 years. Uh, they've actually had a good number of um, participants who are in different places now. Some come back to re, um, to, to speak with current participants. So you see that they're still engaged in the development of other people. So you can see that really they have those leadership traits. Now what I'm looking to is um, like tracing the contact of these people that have had over, over time and um, having conversations with them. And then, well, things have slowed down a bit. Studying to see uh, like a full cycle of a program with a pre and a post um, participation survey in questions to find out what the basic level is because up till now what has been happening is that the people are generally interviewed and, and surveyed and you have those basic reports of what their targets but there's not a systematic way of evaluating the impact um, in place now so my idea would be to design a, a pre-assessment specifically looking for the leadership capacities and qualities in the people so that we can apply it well, when we're able to, when they're able to resume the the normal running of the programs, because right now everything is on hold because of the pandemic, and then to see if we can develop something to follow them to the end to the end of the program after a year, and then go ahead to um, accompany them over the years to see where they are, uh, where they where, wh what impact they have in other places, and then to look at the others who, even though they didn't get this basic um, evaluation before because it's, it's retrospective now, um, maybe apply also the same post-training uh, evaluation interviews to see at least what reports, uh, what um, they attribute or what success they attribute to their participation in those programs and what difference they have been able to make. Uh, in line with that, next slide, please. So this is one of the leadership development program programs uh, flyers. It tells you, uh, invites the, the undergraduate students to come with the minimum requirements and then um, ask them to, to sign up freely for it and then get recommendations later. Next slide, please. And then you have an image of the, the program itself, some participants of the program um, during their interactive sessions. Um, taking notes, uh, sometimes speaking with the participants and um, having normal training activities. On the next slide, please. Here you have the participants out in a, in a rural school teaching the, the students uh, of, of a school things that they have learned and um, trying also to see how to 
already start making an impact while they're still in the program. So that shows that really there is uh, that interest in, in, in making it a, a difference. And um, sometimes they go to have career talks and, and um, hygiene classes, et cetera, for the students. This is the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a cross-section of a group of participants in a particular year, I think 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And um, here they go, um, I think it was one of the rural outreach programs that um, they go to train women in rural areas, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skills, uh, or how to start small businesses. So they go uh, teach them soap making, bean making, crafts, all, all sorts of Things. So all this you have already in, in, in informal reports and the idea would be to have a systematic um, interview and try to take, trace as many of people who have been impacted as possible so you have figures that are more exact. Right now, each program has trained almost 300 people in the last 10 years and um, I think some of them are still in contact with the, the program coordinator, some will um, uh, on and off in contact, but they do have their contact address. So the idea would be to to continue um, this training, this tracing and ask and, and find out what they have been up to and how much impact they're making where they are. Next slide, please. Okay, so a few of the reports of the participants that I've been able to contact and speak with, um, many of them talk about life skills that they have gained, managing time, personal finance, etiquette, and many aspects. This is the word of of the, of the participants that they, they um, realize that they have actually um, benefited from the program. So um, the, the next slide, please. So um, another participant actually says that the sessions promoted self-understanding, understanding others, helping to develop better in the personal relationships and general life skills. So more or less like the, the, what they're saying is they get the training they need for uh, life skills that they wouldn't have gotten from normal school uh, curriculum. So there is some impact. And then um, one has said uh, the self-discovery is it was really like changing and the skills will help in, in her career. And the interviews subsequently will be to follow up and see really how does that really translate to uh, effective life management and, and leading others also um, applying the things that they have learned. Um, right now, some of, the some of the facilitators for some talks are those who have actually participated in the program before. So you already see the people um, coming back or learning things. Next slide, please. So uh, a few of the challenges that um, the report, I mean, the, the interviews they have, is that some of the participants um, find it, um, well, not they don't always find participants who are really willing to uh, look for change. And sometimes you find participants who really um, cannot afford coming to the, to the leadership program on their own. And then the organizers have to do fundraising to subsidize and try and fund um, for everything. So they also have the problems of funding for the programs. They had the, the challenges with the participants who sometimes would uh, be willing or sometimes unwilling to start or willing to finish. But these were minimized. Most of the participants would uh, tend to, to finish the program. More than 80% would finish and stay in touch and still be given that. So you do see that... Um, they're having some. Sometimes the, the, the projects, like I mentioned, because of the structure, uh, the, pro, the projects that the participants have need to be funded. So sometimes the projects get stuck or they take longer than it should be because the participants haven't raised enough funds or they're still trying to um, get the resources together to implement the project. But if we're talking about the, the impact on the person, uh, the, the fact that the person is already um, doing all she can to still continue raising the funds, even though she's not really tied by law or anything to, to continue and finish the project, shows that there really has been um, an, an impact of, of some sort. 
And then uh, the challenges uh, with impact, like I said, is there's documentation from before. There, many of them, there's no previous pre-participation uh, interviews, pre-participation assessments. I mean, there were interviews to, to gauge a level of interest and engagement, of, but there's no standardized um, evaluation of the leadership qualities that the people have. And then um, um, talking with, uh, or the interviews that I did with some of the coordinators said that somehow the, well, the general thing they need would be funds, but at the same time, uh, there's also interest in seeing how to influence policies for educational programs. One of the things um, they had observed is that um, the soft skills, uh, there, there's a, there's a, um, a death, so, so the, the, most, many of the participants realize that they do not have soft skills, interpersonal relations skills, communication, when they're not communication students. So we think if there was policy in education that could actually help them to already um, integrate soft skills from when they're in secondary schools, I mean, age appropriate um, 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 skills also to, to help them to see how to really start relating with others and showing that concern from earlier on, that would really help uh, a lot in the in the program. Um, next slide, please. So um, the next uh, few line uh, line would be to uh, look at those self leadership qualities and um, see uh, how to evaluate. First of all, the the basis of um, the, the the program, the the self leadership principles that they apply, and then to see. Uh, have pre and post um, participation um, assessments to have a, a quantified uh, um, assessment of impact. Um, right now, uh, what I have in mind is um, uh, interviews for those who have been there before, but life story interviews, which is something that is used more in, in psychology, especially in narrative psychology, which is um, part of uh, what I, I, uh, my interest. So to find out the life stories, what 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 are the turning points, um, to see they identify participation in the leadership program as a turning point for the positive impact they've been making in life. And of course, Walter, so eliciting those in, um, elements with interviews could be one, and then um, evaluating them more like a qualitative thing. And then for the assessments for the ones who have not yet participated, you would need a more systematic survey. So, like I said, this is just like the very beginning, a conceptual, uh, I mean, phase. And already, I mean, I carried out some interviews and those structures. I'd really appreciate um, comments, suggestions, and um, ways of collaboration to see how to measure this thing that looks really promising and um, could really um, show a lot of impact since you already have a lot of indices that point out these things. So, uh, next slide, please. So th thank you very much for for listening. It'd be, I'd be I'm happy to take comments, questions, and suggestions, and, and improving the work, um, etc. Okay, that's great. Thanks, um, Ogoyemi, for that presentation. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Ogoyemi. Thank you. Um, thank, you. thank you for your your presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, I realized that um. At um, a pre work that you are doing, but then you have to classify your participants, uh, the beneficiaries that you are talking about. You have to classify them, and I want to know how you are going to do that since they are coming from diverse places and now they have finished the work 10 years ago that you are looking online. So, how are you going to do that? So, you have to find a scientific way, um, way of getting the people so that the work will be um scientific so how are you going to do that okay the second one let me add the second one i okay. think that you should have an evaluation framework a proven evaluation framework that will help you to measure because measuring impact is not always easy without a framework you can be forward and backwards and then you can't get the answers so that one too, I suggest you have a framework that will guide you in evaluating or measuring the impact that you are thinking about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.
-hmm. Okay, so the, the, the first um, observation, the, the beneficiaries, like you said, the, the beneficiaries um, are in different um, phases. You have the participants who are directly um, involved in the training and the difference that, that they, they have had or the, the, the changes you see in character and behavior. And uh, there is a framework uh, that um, talks about the changes in character. But it's um, in, in it's it's a, a, a work in pro in progress um, because measuring character also has it, its um, changes. But the the framework um, you spoke about um, the the theoret the theoretical um, scientific framework to begin with is um, that of studying self leadership because that's the basic principle of this particular program, and then based on the facets. To, of self-leadership to, de to develop the questionnaires that um, identify those features before and after the, the, the training session. But, but um, thank you very much for the questions. It also makes me think a bit more and see uh, how to make them also more specific. Uh, yeah, maybe when I finish with my presentation, uh, you okay. may get some, yeah, we may get some inputs from there. Okay, that would, be, that would be really lovely. And I think that um, if I make the presentation, maybe some of the uh, the indices that I'm using, uh, maybe you can also draw. Okay, them. that would be lovely. Thank you so much. Okay. That's that's great. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth, for this. This was one of my questions as well about measuring the leadership. So maybe you could do something like a pre and post kind of a thing. You run a leadership assessment questionnaire. Yeah. Uh, just when you recruit the, the trainees and yes. then you do it at the end of the program and then you can make an assessment of how they have evolved. Yes. And uh, depending on what kind of model or what kind of um, uh, theory of leadership you want to use or what kind of approach, all of these leadership styles and approaches and theories, they have very established um, assessment questionnaires uh, from, yeah. So you can always find them in, in uh, textbooks and everything. So. Okay, that's great. Uh, if we don't have any questions, we will move on. So Elizabeth, do you want to uh, present now? I'll bring up your paper. So I'm Elizabeth Cornelia Nantra from Ghana, University of Cape Coast. Um, and this my topic is leadership capacity and local uh, level development. Insights from three decentralized um, institutions in the central region of Ghana. In fact, this was um, part of my PhD work I did um, and presented just uh, last year, 2019. So there's an aspect of it and I would want to share uh, so that um, you help me also to um, form it and then for um, publication. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I'll look at the background, the statement of the problem. These are all fused together, the objectives and then literature review, fuel the framework and then research method, okay. Thank you, let's go. Yeah, there has been debate on decentralization. Did I send the right? <laughs> there has been debate on decentralization as the devolution of political, administrative, and fiscal powers to subnational governments. In Ghana, we call them the local government institutions. And these local government institutions are the people who um, are in governance, they are the governance structure within the local sector. And then apart from the governance, they also have the developmental role. These developments are being done within the localities that they find themselves. And therefore, um, these institutions are supposed to have um, what we call the assembly members, the district uh, level members who help with the development of um, the capacity, uh, the, the locals that they find themselves. Now within this particular uh, local government, a lot of things have been happening because people have been saying that their developmental um, issues are not being seen. They all get the necessary leadership capacity training. They get the monies that they have to use in um, building their locals, but then the effect is not being felt. Based on that, governments over the years have had to implement a lot of capacity building um, strategies, giving monies, a lot of um, 
um, what do you call them, um, development agencies have also come on board. And then they have been helped to just help them to improve their capacity so that they'll be able to build the localities that they find themselves. All this, we're looking, a lot of historical approaches uh, says that they were using both supply driven and then the bottom up or the demand driven approaches. But these approaches have not been working because it doesn't help them to really build their capacities. Next slide, please. Um, I, my background, I took the systems theory into consideration because looking at the systems theory, it talks about all aspects of the people within the organization coming on board. So when you are going to train people or build the capacity of individuals within the organization, then it will be important to look at all the resources that you have, whether you have the staff, whether you have IT systems, whether there is quality assurance, and then the office spaces. Aside that, you have to also look at the taxonomies of the leadership styles that you have, both the tangibles and intangibles that you have within the organization. And for leadership also to um, be developed, you need the participative approaches that will help them to learn, own whatever that they are getting, and then be empowered to do their work. The next slide, please. So this gets the background to tell us what the Ghana decentralization system is, the local government institutions that dates back in 1988. And then based on that, we have the district assemblies common fund that is given to these institutions to build their development or do developmental work within the localities that they find themselves. Now in 2006, because of the negative uh, reports that the ministry was getting, the ministry with other development agent, uh, grant brought together what they called the develop district development facility, a functional organizational assessment tool and a capacity building grant that will help them to address the weaknesses of these um, institutions. The urban development grant was also instituted by the World Bank in collaboration with the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. So in, if in effect, you see that from 2007 up to the 2014 or 2019, a lot of capacity building um, efforts have been made, and some of them have been suggested here. And as at 2017, an amount of 317 million Ghana cities have been spent between 2011 and then 2016 for capacity building. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is uh, the result of the functional organization assessment tool that had been was done in Ghana. So this is, it gives us the seven uh, results that have been gotten from 2006 up to 2014. When you look at it, you see that from the 20, uh, 2006, the capacity was low. But as and when they built on the capacity in 2014, majority of them were getting 100%, which meant that um, their capacities have been built and therefore they will be able to do the work that they are supposed to be doing. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the problem was that the results that were get, being um, brought in from the organizations as and when the assessment was made was that everybody, the capacity has been built. People were getting 100%. However, a district league table that was instituted by UNICEF also showed different results. The UNICEF result was that people were not doing well and that development was not happening within the localities that they found themselves. So then it gives me, it, it puts me on the thinking, why is it that people are getting all the, these decentralized institutions are getting 100% in their localities, but then when it comes to developmental issues, they are lagging behind. And that was the reason why I conducted this research. Next one, please. Good. So there's a conceptual gap that debate over the appropriate paradigm to build capacity, whether they are using the right approaches, because we have already learned that the traditional approaches are not being helpful. And therefore, we wanted also strategies devoid of participation and ownership that will also not leave the institutions with uh, learning lessons. The empirical gap is that a lot of work has been done outside, both internationally, 
But when you come to Ghana, and then specifically in the areas that I did the work, the decentralized local government institutions, these um, works are lacking. And therefore, it was very important that I do the work so that at the end of the day, you could even generalize within the locality that I find myself. Next slide, please. Um, we can go on and on, but the question is that what are the approaches being put in place? What strategies were being used and what the best approach was? And these were all strategic issues that needed to be looked at. Next slide. Yeah. These were a lot of objectives. However, with this particular paper that I'm presenting, I'm using just one of them. So I just wanted to look at the as assess the existing capacities of officials of Metropolitan Municipal and the District Assemblies. The rest, the, uh, unfortunately, I think I presented the, the, the other one. So let us, so I'm looking at the second one. Uh -huh. Let's see. Examine, mm -hmm. assess the existing capacities of the officials of Metropolitan Municipal and District Assemblies. The next slide. So, no, you've gone back. Let's go. Uh -huh. uh, so the content is that decentralization local government approaches. The time frame is from 2010 to 2017. Geographical scope is the central region. And the institutions that are used three institutions, so the Cape Coast Metropolitan Assembly, Command the Idnego of Abrim, and then the Abra Asibu Kwamankese District Assemblies. Uh, the Metropolitan Assembly is the only Metropolitan Assembly in central region. Then when you come to uh, the KEA, that one is also a municipal assembly. And then AAK is a district assembly. So I use the three to blend so that you will see what is happening at the metropolitan level, what is happening at the municipal level, and then at the district level. The next slide, please. Um, please let us go. Move on. Yeah, so the, the systems theory, as I've already explained, it looks at the organization as have come in uh, as an independence of each other. They are interrelated and they are interconnected. You cannot say that you want to build the capacity for maybe financial resource without building the capacity for human resource. So once you go into the organization, you need to do all these things and therefore participation of all the people becomes prominent. When you look at the human capital theory, as Amatia San said, Without capacity, there's greater levels of poverty. So it is important that you build the human capacity so that they will build their knowledge, their skills, and then the identity so that they'll be able to fix the factors within the organization. Let us go to the next slide, please. All these uh, theories just came to um, en enrich the work that I did. So the dynamic capabilities theory, uh, capacity building theory, he says that there are a lot of resources and capabilities within an organization, but for these capabilities to be able to deliver, you need to build and then uh, improve upon before they'll be able to do that. And therefore we we'll do that. Then the knowledge-based theory also says that there should be the shared vision, the system thinking, and then the mental models, especially, when you are building uh, the capacity, the strategies that you need to use should be something that will indicate to people what they ought to do. Not always classroom training, but there should be hands-on where they participate so that at the end of the day, people will be able to deliver. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so these ones, they are all theories that came to build upon, I think for the sake of time, would want to go to the actual work. So let us go to the other. Um, uh, so this is the conceptual framework that I developed for the entire work. And as I said, what I'm presenting today is an aspect of whatever I have done. So you see that the local government officials, they have the responsibilities of planning. They have the responsibility of implementing a development a developmental needs, the coordination, monitoring and evaluation. They need to report, give feedback, and then review the developmental work that they have been doing. So when you come to the institution of capacities, then you have to build their leadership capacity. You have to build the resource capacity, human resource management capacity, financial resource management capacity, technical and adaptive capacity. Let me just take some few minutes to explain. When we talk about leadership capacity, 
Then you are talking about their ability to govern, to lead and sustain organizational developments. When you talk about HR capacity, you are talking about the ability to develop policies on recruitment, staffing, compensation, performance management, and others. When you talk about financial resource capacity, then you are talking about the ability to formulate, plan, do procurement, manage and prepare budgets, estimate, or raise funds. When it comes to um, the resource capacity, organizations must have the requisite staff with the requisite knowledge. They should be able to um, have capacity in quality assurance. There should be an ICT in place. And then the office space must be congenial enough for people to move around. When it comes to the technical capacity, we need the capacity or the skills and the tools to design and then to design programs and to be able to evaluate. Then with the adaptive capacity, in other research, they call it research capacity. So people should be able to have environmental research, grammatical, re programmatical research, ability to assess the needs of people so that people can work. So when you come to the assemblies, we have what we call the assembly members. And these people are within the localities. How do you build their capacity so that they're able to assess the needs of the people uh, that are within that particular locality? So the capacity building process here will tell you how to identify the developmental objective, how to assess needs and assets of the people that you are going to uh, build the, or develop, then how to formulate the programs, and then the strategies and methods that you need to do that. The implementation processes, you should have a matrix that will help you so that you'll be able to um, monitor whatever you are doing. You should have a competent facilitator who will be doing that. And then you should always be monitoring with indicators. You cannot just go to the field and say that I come here to see, but there should be indicators or key performance indicators on hand that will help you to do that. Then you, when it comes to evaluation, you should be able to adopt a criteria that will help you to do that. Now, the mediating factors here talks about leadership support. Without the support in the organization, you cannot do that. You should, be, you should have the resources and other things that will help you to do your work. These will come together to empower the people whom, that, whom you are um, um, building their capacities. It will help them to learn because they are participating in whatever you are doing and there is hands-on, they'll be able to learn. And then at the end of the day, they will build ownership of whatever comes out. When these things happen, and the, 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 the um, perception is that effectiveness of local government institutions, and then they'll be able to deliver when it comes to their developmental goals. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the methodology. I use the pragmatism, um, mixed methods, because given the diverse people that I was looking at, um, I, look, I use both questionnaires, I use um, interview guides, and then um, I use, um, um, yes, interview guides, and then interview uh, pa uh, panel. So um, with the, um, the heads of department, I use the interviews, direct interviews. With the assembly members, um, I use the... Um, um, interview guide, and then with the staff, I use the questionnaire. The cross-sectional descriptive um, study design was used. I, the, for the sample determination, I use Cochran and Snedeker's um, formula, 1980. So the Takata sample was 453, the actual sample size was 470, and the response rate was 92.1%. Next slide, please. Yeah, so as I said, a multi-stage sampling was used. I used purposive sampling to um, sample the Cape Coast Municipal Assembly. As I said, Cape Coast is only the Metropolitan Assembly we have. So that one, I used purposive sampling, but I wanted to know. So that one, and then the Human Resource Director at the Local Government Service in Accra, the Regional Coordinating Council, the Monitoring Evaluation Director, and then the um, Municipal and District Coordinating Directors heads of the HR, and then um, the municipal and uh, district planning offices. All these people were purposely sampled and these were interviewed. Sample random sampling was also used to select one municipal, um, um, one district and then one municipal assembly from the, but we have 22 of them. So aside CCMA, you have 21. Out of the 21, we have 16 MMDs 
and then the rest were district assembly. So district uh, sample random sampling was used to select one each from these columns. Then assembly members are used convenient sampling. The reason is that these people are uh, the people who reside with the community members and therefore come only for meetings when it is their time. And uh, to much as, much as I tried to use snowballing, I couldn't get them and therefore I used convenient sampling. So I invited them and I met them the day that they were going to have their meetings. So as and when they came in, I did the interviews. Then with the staff, in the assemblies, we have two types of staff. We have mechanized and the non-mechanized staff. The mechanized staff are those that the government paid. They are on the government payroll. The non-mechanized staff are being paid from the um, institution's own um, IGF uh, the, uh, fund, the institutional grant that they got. Then also non-probability sampling was used, so the quota sampling was used for the representatives. Then, so let us go to the table. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, with the, the survey, I use the survey, no, please. Next one. Okay. Okay. So these ones I've already explained. I did a, a pre testing at another um, assembly, and the Convac Alpha reliability was 97. To, uh -huh. So let us go to the other one. The next slide, please. Yeah. So these are the research questions. Okay. So these are effect, excuse me, effectiveness model. And as I said, Ubuntu can look at all these models. These are models that you can use to measure effectiveness. We have the goal model, we have the strategic constraints model, we have the systems model, and then the UNDP for them, they use a common sense approach. So from her side, then I could see that you wanted to use a common sense approach. So these are some of the models that you can use, read about, and then use them to do the impact study. Let us go to the other. Yeah, so this is the demographic characteristics of the respondents that are used. You could see that male, a total of 339, and then female, 78. Then in the assemblies, this thing is worrying me. The click to join video chat, can it be removed? There is something to click to join video chat. I think mm -hmm. maybe you're just hovering your mouse over the screen if you move your mouse away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the assembly over the years that they have spent, you see, the educational level, basic level, diploma, bachelor, masters, and others. Now with the others, these are people who just do the menial job. These are the janitors. And as and when they come in, they normally some of them don't even have the basic education. So that is what we have there. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. So um, these are the roles and the responsibilities of the MMDAs, the Metropolitan Municipal and District Assemblies. We have the institutions of the government. These are the local government service, which are the, to be decentralized, the regional district and sub district. So you find all of them there. They provide technical assistance. Then you have the regional, you have the regional coordinating council and their departments. They also plan and implement um, developmental organizations, harmonizing and monitoring and evaluating the works of the assemblies. Then we have the district assemblies and their department. These are also, they implement the district legislation, the district policy and strategy, the strategic uh, district development planning and all that. Then we have the assembly members, as I've already said, these are the, co they coordinate within the, uh, the localities that they find themselves. And these people, they are voted into the positions. So it means that when you go there, you have to come and report back to the organization. We also have the urban and the zonal town councils and their secretariats. These, they collect the data, they plan the resource mobilization, and then they do other things for the assemblies. We also have the unit, unit committees and their residents. With the unit committees, they do the resource mobilization. So when it comes to like taxing and other things, they go around to the market to collect or give out issued tickets to uh, market women. So these are the people. So these form the responsibilities of the MMDs. Next slide, please. Yeah. So the, as I said, I want to. The, my result is on this one. So I looked at the components of the institutional capacity based on the numerous uh, training or capacity building programs that have been done within the organization. I looked at the resource capacity 
which include office facilities and other logistics. I looked at their staffing, their finance. Then I looked at leadership capacity, human resource management capacity, financial management capacity. Yes, we can hear you my, now. My, 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 my lights went off. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, as I was saying, so I'm going to look at these um, technical capacities and then see whether how people, people's perception about the, 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 the leaders within the organization. Next slide, please. Uh -huh. So when I went there, the department in the selected MMBAs, so there should be all these departments to be present within the MMDAs. So you could find out that it's, uh, at the, the, um, the CCMA, that is the only metropolitan, all the departments were present. Now, when you come to the district, the metropolitan, sorry, the municipal assembly, there was no legal department, there was no budget and rating department. And then when you come to the district assembly, there was no legal department, there was no budget and trading, training and rating, there was no transport, and there was no routes, and then also there was no waste management department. Now, the absence of these things will hamper or hinder the progress of their developmental issues. So unless these, uh, so in my recommendation, I recommended that these departments must be established so that at the end of the day, they will be able to also deliver. Next slide, please. Good. So this one, then the status of key senior staff in So you see that there was a minister or the Metropolitan Chief Executive and then the District Chief Executive, all three were president of our great education health, finance officer, budget officer, social welfare. Hello. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. We're back. Hello. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. The lights here. You see, a uh, developing country. You see how I'm suffering. <laughs> sorry. Uh -huh. So, apart from the unit committee, so in all the three, the unit committee members have not been sworn in, so they were not present. Next slide, please. Good. So, with the office facilities. Uh, my uh, so because I did um or I did um, um office checks, uh, documentary review. So I saw that with physical equipment such as computers, tables and chairs, they were inadequate in all the three of them. So as you could see, the total 163.5 percent of the respondents said that these um, gadgets were in inadequate within the three um, assemblies. Now when you come to the office space they all said it was adequate because 51% indicated that they, they had enough office space to operate. Next slide, please. Yeah, so these are some of the qualitative responses. People said that they were using, uh, they, they, they were housed and deplorable, their, vehicle, their vehicles are, much as they've been submitted their budget, vehicles are not, um, what improve for them, they don't buy it, uh, new ones for them. Others also shared that, you see, we have small offices, but then we don't have our own privacy because a lot of people needed to share the offices. One of them said, I'm using my own laptop to work. So in the event that I leave this organization, it means I have to go with the institutional members, okay? And then the, for the assembly members, all of them said that they needed logistics to work within their own communities. They don't have offices, they don't have anything. So these are some of the qualitative responses I had from the respondents. Next slide, please. Good. So on staffing, all three said they had adequate staffing. So out of the 282, we had 218, mm -hmm. signifying 77.3%. And then staff with the abilities and the requisite abilities to work, we also had 67% and who said that they had the skills and abilities to work. 
Next slide, please. So these are also qualitative responses from the heads of departments that I spoke with. Some of the staff have no qualification, skill or knowledge about the work we do here. The reason being that recruitment is being done at the central ministry and posted here without inquiring about what we need. And this is the reason why they should um, build the capacity of the human resource managers within their own assembly so that they'll be able to do the recruitment themselves. Let's go to the next slide. Yes. So for information technology, just as I'm experiencing, you see that it's poor. So you are not to be told. They said for modern IT mechanisms, internet and website, they all said it was poor, 62.8%. And true, because you don't have um, systematic light, you don't have systematic IT or internet section. And as I am struggling now, you see that it is poor. So that is what the assemblies also told me. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh huh. Good. So the systems. Uh -huh, okay, that's okay. So the systems and funds for capacity building. So you could see that the systems in place, the, 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 all those things were not uh, in place. Your performance management system they didn't have. So then I ask questions. How do you evaluate your people? How do you do performance? appraiser if you don't have performance management system in place quality assurance mechanism they have it capacity building framework they don't have it but for the quarter they have a vision they have a mission and these are all clearly defined let's go to the next slide no Let's go. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, if they are finding it difficult, so on um, on the let me, let me use my slide, uh, my this thing. Okay. okay. Again. So on the capacity issues, since I'm not getting the slides, on the capacity issues. With leadership capacity, I found moderate capacity within the three uh, um, MMDs. With KEA, we had 70, 70%, 78% saying that the, the um, leaders there have a leadership capacity. We had 50% from CCMA saying that they have moderate capacity. And then from AAK, go, go to the next one. From AAK, we had... 65% saying that the people go, go to the next one. The next one, go, good. So that's what I'm talking about. We asked them, no, the, the first one, uh -huh. So we asked about the leadership capacity and they all said their leaders have moderate leadership capacity. So it means that the ability to retain and train people over here is moderate, as you could see. So in a total, 163. 3.8, so 180 respondents indicated that within the assemblies, they had moderate leadership capacity. With human resource management capacity also, they said they had moderate capacity. As you could see, 47.3 from KEA, 62.5 points from, uh, from CCMA, and then 48.3 from AAKDA. So in all, 53.2 indicated that their leaders had moderate human resource management capacity. Let's go to the next slide. Yes, with financial management, as I already indicated, so if you have financial management capacity, you should be able to formulate plans, do procurement and all that. And over here too, they said that their people had moderate um, capacity. So you have 39, uh, 37 point, 37, 37.5, and then so over, overall, you have 49, um, oh, sorry, 17.4. Who said, I think this one, there's, uh -huh. so let me see. Okay. So over here too, you see that, oh, I think I've mixed something here, but they were all moderate. 
And then the technical capacity too, we had moderate capacity. From the three, we had 56.4% indicating that their leaders had technical, moderate technical capacity. With adaptive capacity, 50.4% indicated that their leaders had moderate adaptive capacity. Looking at all these uh, moderate capacities that they have and the, the kind of burden on the assemblies for them to be able to do all kinds of things, how to lead, how to govern, how to develop policies, how to formulate plans, how to do procurement, how to even get the tools and design programs. And if they all have moderate um, capacities, then it will, they will all have implications for the um, MMDA that they are working with. The next slide, please. So this takes me to my conclusion. Over here, this, I conclude that unit committee members were not integrated in all the three assemblies. Then the key officials were also fully present in the assemblies, which was a plus for them. Funds for capacity building, in fact, were they were made made me to they made me to understand that they were not used for its intended purposes. Some of them are diverted to do other things. Then the basic facilities such as computers were inadequate and they were lacking in all the three assemblies. Staff with requisite staff uh, skills abilities were also inadequate. And similarly, authorities were seen as having moderate leadership, human resource management, financial resource management, technical capacity, as well as adaptive capacities. Another problem was the inadequate uh, or lack of information technology facilities, and then the lack of regular internet facility, which always hamper our work that we do. Next slide. So with the recommendations, these recommendations were made to the Ministry of Local Government and Rural, um, rural um, Institution, and then the assemblies themselves, and then the Regional Coordinating Council, that all leadership of assemblies should ensure that unit committees are inaugurated, because these people are the ones who will come in to strengthen with the um, mobilization of resources, and if they are not there, and as the Act also say, the Local Governance Act 2016, it enshrined that these people should be um, in the organization so that they will help with the formation or mobilization of the resources. Then there is also, I am also recommend that funds for capacity building from development of agencies and from the ministry should be used as intended. If it should be used to develop capacities, that is what they should be doing. Then the responsibilities of the assemblies are numerous, and therefore the, these offices should be strengthened in terms of basic office facilities, such as computers, internet, and other ICT um, items, so that they will improve their work. Then given the inadequate staff skills and abilities to work, leadership of the assembly should assess the skills level and train them to be able to function. Similarly, authorities with moderate leadership, human resource management, financial resource management, technical and adaptive capacities should be developed to be able to achieve their functional mandate. So in a nutshell, um, I think that this work looked at these capacities within the organization, the myriad training that um, the organizations or the government has put in place, the funds that have been committed into this um, capacity building, and then vis-a-vis -vis the capacities that are now being exhibited within the organizations. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Yes, the end. So I think that with this and uh, what I've presented, if there are questions, there are um, inputs that will help me build on it so that I'll be able to publish. Thank you so much. So your slides are there. You can start your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, morning. My name is my Henry Ogato, uh, my co-author, uh, Dr. Ogato Hosui uh, is not here. So I will be doing the presentation on our behalf. The, uh, as you can see on the slide, the topic, uh, the paper is interrogating citizens inequality and its impact on development in Nigeria's democratic experience, the 1999 to 2019. 
imperatives for leadership reorientation and resilience. Uh, what we have tried to put down, we looked at the introduction and then uh, we reviewed the literature uh, by trying to look at some of the concepts and then we have a theoretical framework and then we also try to draw a nexus between inequality and development and then we went ahead to look at the methodology and then uh, our major findings and then we discussed the findings and then we came to conclusion and tried to come up with some recommendation so i will try to be on point um Nigeria, uh, in the, the, the slide you can see here, Nigeria prides itself as the most populous country in Africa. In fact, they see themselves as the most viable, you know, whereas, but from the Fourth Republic, which is 1999 to date, uh, the envisaged dividends uh, has not really been achieved. That in terms of governance and developmental uh, achievements, they've been really poor. And these are things that uh, we ordinarily impact positively on the citizens of uh, the country, you know. Indeed, primordial issues like tribalism, religious bigotry, divisive atavism, and nepotism, corruption and all that continue to raid our heads and that is like the order of the day. And these uh, kind of uh, exacerbated the political and social inequalities that today threatens national cohesion and the call for cessation is all over. In Nigeria, you have the iPod and uh, even the Midwest uh, movement, they are all calling for cessation. When they are not calling for cessation, they are calling for uh, restructuring or true federalism. I start wondering, because I'm a political scientist too, I start what is true federalism. It's either you are practicing federalism or you are not practicing federalism. So what we are, you see clamoring for true federalism, which is a pseudo confirmation that the federal system that is in operation is not what it is. And uh, to, you know, to add to this is the presidential system of government that is highly distorted in the case of Nigeria due to the over concentration of power at the center, which is under the absolute control of the president, you know? And uh, what this implies is that the leadership style and behavior of the president will detect the direction of the country, that is, will detect the coercion stability and even the development of the country everything because of the enormous power that is given to the president you know his own style of governance can detect everything you know since in 19, since 1999 to date the country's leadership has not lived up to expectations in bringing about the required leadership to propel national coercion stability and social economic development. Hence, the rise in conflicts, you have religious conflict, communal conflict, the rise in militancy, you have the Boko Haram, you have the armed banditry, you have the Fulani Esme invasion, the Niger Delta militancy, they are just all over. All of these are fair development and unity. They is, and is not unconnected with inequality and marginalization. marginalization which leadership has ignored. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so from that uh, cartoon you can see there, a development in Africa, uh, you see the gentleman striving to achieve greater height, and then you see the hand holding him back, religion and leadership, trying to hold him from achieving the, the greater height that is um, clamoring for. So, and uh, the objective of this paper, you can go to the next slide, please. The objective of this paper is to characterize leadership style adopted by the Nigerian state and to the, and the extent it has prepared inequality 
amongst the citizenry and the attendant negative impact on national development and cohesion and to find a way forward. So in the literature, we, uh, we try to do a little bit of review. Um, we I'm not going to bore us with all this, but we conceptualize literature. i uh, sorry, in the literature, the leadership was conceptualized as the process of influencing and supporting others towards achieving objective. You know, that is the way the ability to make others do what they should do without you sitting on them and uh, forcing them and uh, cross-checking what they are doing with a checklist. You know, you make them to do what they are supposed to do. So leadership connotes the leader's ability to motivate or influence others to the point of being a facilitator. And then uh, we also looked at effective leadership, field leadership and all that. And then we said, for you to be an effective leader, there are some traits which uh, Newstrom and Davis uh, came up with. These traits are physical, intellectual, or personality characteristics. These are the determinants. However, such traits include a high level of personal drive, the desire to lead, personal integrity, cognitive ability, business knowledge, charisma, creativity, flexibility, and personal worth. And the traits need to be developed for effective leadership. It's not a case of just having the traits, but they need to be developed, okay? They need to be uh, worked on. So pertinent to this discourse is the issue of leadership style. And uh, the, the three leadership style was delineated, the autocratic uh, leadership style, participative, and the free reign. The autocratic leadership style, that is where leaders centralize power and decision-making in themselves. The free reign is like the direct opposite of it, which is um, uh, where leaders allow followers to establish goals and take decisions. And then the middle one, which is the participative leadership, the power is decentralized. There is consultation uh, with followers. Then again, we we would look at uh, the clarification, we we're trying to define the concept. The first um, presenter today talked about self-leadership. It is very germane. And uh, we also have it here, self-leadership, the process of influencing oneself. Okay, this is the work of Nick and Mans, uh, the process of influencing oneself, motivating oneself to achieving the set goals. And... Um, you know, three strategies have been identified. We have the self-imposed strategies, the self-reward strategies, and the self-punishment strategies. You know, what they have mentioned are the relatively new concepts of servant leadership and transformation leadership. These are all types of leadership, and that will help, you know. The concept of leadership's resilience was also I talked about the work of uh, Luke, uh, 2009, characterizes the concept as a condition and a, and a consequence of the actualization and exercising of leadership in difficult and demanding situations. Thus, a leader must boost, that he must be proactive, it, they must, he must have self-leadership, he must have good health, and intrapersonal intelligence. And if you look at the literature in the last five years uh, under the present administration, you see that a lot of uh, uh, development, you know, the lopsidedness in appointments, uh, um, the, the fulanization, uh, if you like, uh, the killings of, uh, by Boko Harams, uh, you know, and all that, they are the challenges. So the question to ask is what type of leadership style is deployed that is encouraging all these developments? Next slide, please. So we look at the, 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 the theory that this work is relying on. 
We are looking at the social conflict theory. Uh, it views society as an arena where conflict takes place as a result of inequality, which is a function of race, class, sex, culture, religion, etc., resulting in conflict and dominance of one group over other ethnic group or groups in the same political system or society. And um, it also involves coercive power and uh, domination, where the, the, the Marxian viewpoint of social conflict states that social class and inequality emerged because the social structure is based on conflict and contradictions over scarce resources. So what you find is because of limited resources, there is this struggle for dominance and uh, other uh, uh, factors, primordial factors will start uh, playing, playing up, uh, you know, thereby exacerbating the inequality that already exists and the marginalization that is uh, in place. Uh, please, next slide. Okay, inequality and uh, development nexus. Here we try to draw a nexus between inequality and development. Um, I'm sure we, we are all very familiar with the works of Dudley Shear. When he was looking at the parameters for development, he talked about inequality and um, that if it's on the increase, if poverty is on the increase and all that, then you cannot see there is development. He asserts that as inequality is on the increase, development is hampered. So that is um, what uh, Dr. Shea talked about. It's one of the three parameters he, he propounded in his work. You know, this paper intends to provide answers to the following questions. Does inequality affect the development of Nigerian states and to what extent? Two, what role does leadership style play in creating inequality? Now, therefore, uh, for, for you to understand me fully, uh, inequality is the difference in weight between individuals and groups in a given society or societies. Um, two types of inequality have been identified in the, in the literature. You have the economic inequality, and then you have the inequality of opportunities. The economic inequalities here, you are talking about the income. You're talking about the weight. You're talking about the consumption pattern, you know, and ability. While the inequality of opportunities is talking about gender, religion, ethnicity, uh, the, 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 the geographical location, and all that. In Nigeria, the inequality of opportunities have been found to detect the pace of economic inequality. You know, it's like gender, if you are a male, like the women folks, are, they, they are seriously discriminated against. So if you are a male, you have more opportunity for a lady to rise up to that level, a lot of problems, a lot of, uh, you know, challenges uh, would have been faced and surmounted. And then religion, oh, what religion do you belong to? I know that they all play a role. So at the end of the day, they, they detect where you are employed, how you are employed, where you are employed, and uh, the kind of work that you display. So um, in Nigeria, the inequality of opportunities, like I said, detects the economic or the pace of the economic inequality. And then you now look at the consequences of inequality, you know, the oppressed, you know, engage in crime, riots, destructive activities, you know, just like what you find in the US and all over the world under the Black Lives Matter is just a reaction to the inequality in the system. Thus, time would have been, thus, time that would have been devoted for the developmental efforts are wasted while trying to solve the, the, the problems, the, you know, that, that, that resonate as a result of 
uh, inequality. You know, you have conflict, you have social unrest. So I haven't said that, I will just go straight to research uh, methodology. <clears throat> the next slide, please. Yeah, this study utilized the qualitative research design. Uh, we looked at two focused group discussions. Uh, these discussions were held under the guidance of uh, the researchers, that is uh, my partner and I, and two assistants. Uh, the group comprised of uh, relevant stakeholders, uh, university students, lecturers, uh, politicians, and public servants. We also picked some people from the NGOs and the women's group. You know, each um, group comprised of 15 and 12 participants each, or drawn from Benin City, where we reside. And uh, we also relied on secondary sources of data, like newspaper commentaries, documentary evidence, published works on the issue, and uh, the likes. So the focus group discussions were recorded, transcribed, and subjected to thematic content analysis, manually by coding and delineating the emerging themes. So um, next slide, please. So the uh, findings and the discussion of our findings, uh, inequality and poverty in Nigeria is on the increase, no doubt, and assuming on unimaginable proportion. About 90% of participants highlighted the features of inequality to be gender-based and really and regional and religious in nature. Women were considered to be mostly affected. Most of them now take to local trading and uh, subsistence farming uh, for their families, you know, feeding and all that. So uh, government efforts at reducing the inequality gap has failed. Uh, the trader money initiative by the federal government of Nigeria was a political gimmick to buy vote as it was done during the 2019 elections. Just about two weeks before the elections, the federal government came about that. Oh, there is poverty in the land. There is need to bridge this gap. And uh, they started sharing the sum of 10,000 Naira each to the traders in the markets and all that. And the problem was how did they come about uh, this? So we asked, you must have a voter's card and know that that is that should not be a precondition uh, for it, but that was the case. So a lot of people have uh, seen it. Those in the focus group, they say it was vote buying and not trying to close the the inequality gap and the poverty gap. You know, another dimension to inequality revealed in the study has to do with inequality characterized as ethnic, regional, and religious. This obtains more in appointment to government positions, you know, like in Nigeria, for Tango, a lot of Nigerians uh, in this panel, you have all the service chiefs, apart from one, is uh, all from the president's uh, uh, Northern stock, you know, all the NPC appointments, in spite of the fact that uh, oil is not gotten from the north, all of them for about uh, 20 years have continued, uh, you know, apart from one, have continued to be the group MD, have continued to come from the north. And all the major positions, you know, is it the director of SSS or everything that has to do with security? Even when you talk about uh, fighting corruption, everyone is from the president's stock. You know, that is why I said at the beginning that the president's uh, leadership style, you know, will detect exactly what happens to the entire nation in terms of uh, poverty reduction, in terms of coercion, and all that. Again, uh, if you look at the slide, key appointments 
are lopsided in favor of Northern Fulani Muslims who have dominated all aspects of life. And this does not reflect competencies in skills and qualifications. And you agree with me that this will affect development because when you start putting uh, certain persons in positions of authority and where you have better hands somewhere, then uh, you cannot really be wishing the nation the very best. You've also found a situation where the Maritime University uh, is located in Daura, in the north, you know. There is no river there. Yeah, I mean, I begin to wonder as a university lecturer where the students are going to have their practicals. So it's located over there. And then you even have a five-star hotel in, in Duara Casino State, which is a desert and a zero tourist potential. What we are trying to say is that funds that would have been allocated to areas that can bring about developmental uh, situations in the country are put in projects that cannot lead to development. You know, you also have the multi-billion dollars railway project linking Daura to Niger Republic, which is of no economic and developmental value. The decision is as a result of the president lackluster leadership, and of course, maybe to satisfy uh, some other primordial factors. So Nigerian democratic experience to date has witnessed abysmal poor democratic dividends. Development is affected. Thus, there is call for restructuring. There is call for true federalism, whatever they mean by that. There is call for cessation and breakup of the entire country. Uh, Boko Haram and banditry are fueled by inequality, brought about by inert leadership that has failed to respond. The resilience of uh, leadership is low in solving uh, these issues. Next slide. Yes. Okay, so we are, we are just uh, running out of time. If you could speed up the presentation. Yes, that's why I asked how many minutes. I'm trying to work within that 15, okay. 20 minutes. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be done now. Okay. okay. So you have a lot there on the screen there. They will have the travel. There's a problem of peace. That, that is the essence of peace. Funds that would have been used, you know, that um, that will bring about developmental programs are used in combating uh, conflicts that are brought about because of inequality. You now have regional governments trying to set up their own security outfit, like in the south where you have the Amotekon. In the east, they have their own. The south south where I'm from, they are trying to uh, uh, come up with their own. So leadership reorientation with a view to imbibing resilience and participation of all and to reduce to its barest minimum support for primordial divisive factors like ethnicity, religious bigotry, and entrainment of incompetencies in key development areas. These are our findings. And uh, OK, let's just go to conclusion. Let's go to conclusion. So this paper drew a nexus between inequality as a developmental concern and the role of leadership behavior. Inequality is on the increase in the forms of ethnic, gender, and religious inequalities, which has impacted negatively on development in Nigeria. The situation has provided basis for agitation, for restructuring of the country, and or outright cessation by groups, banditry, crisis, and the call for cessation, restructuring has been encouraged by lackluster leadership that is inert and divisive, given its non proactive posture and poor resilience attitude to leadership and governance. The leadership on responsiveness has given impetus to crisis, killings, banditry, ethnic invasion you know, uh, kidnapping, you know. So this paper recommends that for development to obtain, peace is essential, which only a resilient leadership can bring about that can lead to development. Next slide, please. 
Next slide. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Henry, for this. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? If anyone wants to raise hands or text or anything. Okay. So um, now, since we are just um, out of time for this session, we have decided that we will move the fourth presenter to the next session at 2 o'clock um, in the same panel. The presenters already know about this. They will be the first presenters in the next session at 2 o'clock. And then for this session, if we have any more questions or anything, then we can take up all of those in the next session. Okay, so... Uh, 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 Asad, I, I think I, I, I probably um, in continuation to what Henry has just presented, I, I, I just want to uh, ask a, a little bit, just more of a comment. Uh, Henry, it's a very nice presentation regarding Nigeria. Um, are you hearing me, Henry? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. oh that's good. Okay, so I, I'm just wondering because there, there were like, uh, you know, yesterday there were like a couple of papers also presented um, um, in the context of all that political economy in Nigeria. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, because it, it really, you know, uh, uh, one of the factor for this all instability and lack of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, a, a, a lack of motivation on the part of those who are at the helm of affairs in Nigeria, probably because of due to the fact of the resources, uh, because Nigeria, you know, it's, it's uh, quite a rich in oil as well. So uh, uh, you are already familiar with the resource curse, you know, uh, probably that is because of the reason that uh, so much inequality over there, because very few people, you know, um, uh, who have that, um, access to the resources particularly the oil and uh, probably that leads to all those sorts of political economy problems and you know at the end of the day uh, you know the equilibriums are not optimum you know uh, the productivity and efficiency remains at low level so how much do you think that this uh, resources um, and and the power politics behind that in uh, getting hold of those resources is really responsible for you know uh, the underdevelopment of nigeria yes uh, thank you very much um i think uh, you're right on point uh, uh a lot of us uh, even mm. believe that the the oil that was gotten in nigeria uh, that mm. was supposed to be a blessing has turned out to be a, a curse because um a lot of other areas that would have brought about development were jettisoned, you know, farming, for instance, was jettisoned. Other industrial base, instead of using what was uh, uh, gotten from oil to develop other areas, they were siphoned, you know, a lot of uh, uh, a struggle for positions, you know, uh, came on board. Uh, it was a case of individuals being given oil well. You know, that is like sharing sharing the wealth of the nation to few individuals. I, I mean, and we have a ministry that is in charge of that. So why give some few individuals two, three oil wells? So that breeds inequality. And it, it, and it permeates into other areas, even politics. Because in situation where a rich man, a very wealthy man, you know, determines who becomes the governor of a state, because he funds him and all that. So like uh, what you just said, it has become a curse. And uh, some of us are even very happy that the price of oil and the demand for oil is going down in the whole world. And uh, they are beginning to look inward. Uh, they are beginning to look at other aspects of uh, development. They are beginning to look at farming. They are beginning to look at... Uh, uh you know small scale industries and all that so i think uh, is uh, it has is, it has been a curse to us mm -hmm. rather than a blessing yes thank you very much okay thank you uh, yeah am i online yes you are yeah. okay. Can you hear me? good um has um um the topic the topic of your work and then um, looking at the 
the methodology, that's the constituents that you used. You said you used two focus groups for the discussion. Yeah. But then you yeah. had different you had different constituents coming. Now how did you put them together into two groups given their different horizons and coming from different perspectives? Yeah, what we just simply did was um, we we spread them out. That is, we picked, uh, look for similarities. For instance, where you have uh, in a particular group, you have uh, students too, you have uh, NGO too, and other. So we try to balance the the the, the, the nomenclature of the of the groups you know so that we'll be able to do uh, a proper uh, comparison so that's what we did um give it because um when you take students and when you take non-governmental organizations i think they're actually they postgraduate are, they're actually graduate students post yeah. but i think yeah. that their their perspective might be different because when you take ngos and then when you take students, they might not be thinking the same. So I was of the view that you could have grouped them so that at least your result, in your results, you should be able to differentiate between these ideas. Uh, that's just a suggestion. And now okay. in, the, in, the, in the discussion, the findings and discussions, uh, I saw suddenly bringing something like the money initiative, which came into money. the 2019. Money initiative, which came into the 2019 elections and all that. Uh, these were not found in your background or the literature, or maybe because it's not extensive. Because um, given that your focus was on the leadership styles, because you already mentioned three leadership styles in the background, but then I didn't find those ones in your um, the findings. So given yeah. the style, which, which type of style were they using? And why did it land them in that uh, what they were doing uh, inequality? Do you get it? Yeah. Yes, I think I, I couldn't get uh, get to it very well. The audio I, was. I said that. If I said that um, from the background, yes. you clearly you clearly indicated three leadership styles, yes. and that we're going to look through which of the styles that Nigerian leaders were using, and why it yes. has landed us in that inequality but then in yeah. your discussions and the findings and discussion i didn't see any of this okay so okay. i think if you come out clearly the type yeah. of style that you found and how they use those styles to their own benefit causing the inequality yeah. that's true thank you very much it is in the work as a matter of fact you know i had to start jumping uh, because you know i even asked a pertinent question that the type of leadership style detects uh, yes. what happened. Yes, exactly. and thank you for, yeah, for bringing it up. Now, yes. And then your, your cartoon. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. you presented one cartoon, and the cartoon I saw yeah. religion and slash leadership. Why yeah. did you isolate religion and then bring it? Because then one will see that it's about religion. And if you don't take care, because you have inside information, or you because you are from Nigeria, then we would be tempted to think that you already knew the results before the work got started. Yeah, uh, so that cartoon, that cartoon is not my, it's not my work. I, I <laughs> Yes, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. I so know. I'm not, like, I'm not like cartoonist. Yes, but again, if you look at it, religion and uh, and leadership in Nigeria, they are inextricably missed. Honestly, mm -hmm. they are inextricably missed. But that is not the focus of the work. Mm -hmm. You know, the focus of the work is leadership. And the leadership style that is adopted exactly. in Nigeria uh, mm -hmm. is, is the type that has led to a lot of the findings and the situation. And that leadership style, you know, is we have the 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 autocratic leadership style mixed mixed with the uh, an element of free reign where certain things are happening in some quarters you just pretend like nothing is happening uh we even uh, suggested the participatory 
leadership as part of our solution. But I couldn't put them all here because of time. Yeah. But well, I can send you, I can send you the final work and uh, maybe still get some input from you. I would love that. Have, because now you have come out clearly uh, with two leadership styles that the people love. Because definitely, one uh, leaders will not use just one leadership style. So once you have come out with the two, yeah. I think they should be prominent in the findings. Yeah. 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 Like I said, I will send you the final paper to get more of your inputs. I I love your um, contributions. But I also want to quickly say something to Elizabeth. We were told in Nigeria that they don't take light in Ghana. So I'm surprised you said the light went off. So <laughs> I don't know. That, that must have one off. It usually doesn't go off. <laughs> and then so the internet app it's, it's very bad. So I didn't okay. even get I didn't even get feedback on my work. So okay. I don't know whether I'll be giving some time so that people will give me feedback on my work. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, time, time is very short, actually. Okay, well, thanks for the comments, and um, both Elizabeth and Henry. Uh, we Thank will you. meet again in um, Thank you another couple of hours at 2 o'clock for the next session. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a continuation of the same topic and the same theme that we have within the panel. So okay. thank you um, again, everyone. Um, Ogunya, me as well. So we will see we, um, all of you in the second session at 2 o'clock. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jan. For Will you be around in the second session? Uh, Jan. Is that me? No, no. Uh, no, no. Henry, thank you very much. We, we are talking about the... Uh, yeah. The oh, okay. Okay, that's that's fine. So we'll we'll meet again at two o'clock then, everyone. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank, All right. You. thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.